In the previous sections, we've looked at relative extrema, meaning the relative minimum or the relative maximum. Those weren't absolute, it just happened to be relative to their position. Now we're going to be looking at the absolute, meaning the highest or the lowest point on a graph. So let's look at some of these graphs. On number five, we are confined between the interval of zero and two, and I want to look at the lowest point and the highest point. Well, I think you can obviously determine that that would be the lowest point and that would be the highest point. So the absolute minimum would be when x is 0, y is negative 2, and the absolute maximum is when x is 1, y is 3. Just to compare to the previous section, if this graph would have maybe gone on like that, this would have been a relative minimum, not an absolute minimum. And so that is the difference between the previous sections and this current section. On the next graph, we have a function defined from negative infinity to positive infinity. Again, I think this point is pretty clear that that is the absolute minimum, and that is 0, 0. But what about this? This keeps going up and up and up till forever, and so does this. So we would say there is no absolute maximum, but there is an absolute minimum. On number seven, this graph uh, has an asymptote, and so this graph gets really, really close to three but never touches it, and that would be the highest, but again, since we don't have an exact point, we would say there is no absolute maximum value, and this graph keeps going down to negative infinity, because this would also be an asymptote, so we would also have no absolute minimum on this graph. Now what happens when we don't have a graph and we're asked to find the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum? Well, just like we did in previous sections, we're going to have to look at the first derivative and the critical points. So in order to find the absolute extrema on a closed interval, meaning that the domain has to be something other than negative infinity to positive infinity. We're going to find those critical numbers, which means take the derivative. And then we also have to evaluate that function at each critical number in addition to the end points. And then we're going to see just which one is the biggest and which one is the smallest. That's all there is to it. This first problem is not on a closed interval, but it still asks us to find the absolute maximum or the absolute minimum value. So let's see. We are going to assume the domain to be all real numbers because that's what it should be for a polynomial. I'm still going to take my first derivative. I'm going to set it equal to zero to find those critical numbers, and I get two-thirds. Now since I cannot evaluate the function at the end point, I need to go back to the previous section and see is two-thirds a minimum or a maximum. All right. So if I pick a number to the right and to the left and evaluate that derivative at zero, I would get negative four. And if I evaluate that derivative at one, I would get positive two. So that means it would decrease and increase. So that would be a minimum. And since this is going to increase all the way, there would be no absolute maximum. But the minimum would be when x is two-thirds. But that is not the answer. That's just the x value. The absolute minimum would be the y value. Now let's come back up here and just remember some things. That's a parabola. It's a quadratic function. The leading coefficient is positive, so I know it looks something like this. And so that absolute minimum is the vertex. And I need to find the y value. So the y value is the absolute minimum value. How do I find that? I would go back and plug in two-thirds for x. And using a calculator that does fraction, I get 23 thirds. So my absolute minimum is going to be 23 thirds. The next example is the same thing. It's not on a closed interval. We need to know where the minimums and the maximums are, and then we can see about if it's going to be absolute. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the derivative, and I'm going to rewrite that with a positive exponent, so I'd have 1 over x to the 2 thirds power. 
So my critical numbers are when that equals to zero, which it doesn't, or when it's undefined. And since x is in the denominator, it's undefined at x is equal to zero. And again, since I can't test my endpoints, I'm going to see about increasing and decreasing. So I'm going to pick some numbers to the right and to the left and evaluate my derivative at negative 1. So remember, what does this mean? This means the cube root of negative 1 squared. So negative 1 squared is positive 1, the cube root of positive 1. So that's 1, which is positive. And the same thing here, we would also get positive. So that means it's increasing on both. So this number 0 is an asymptote, but it's not a minimum value or a maximum value. So this one would have no absolute extrema. It would have no relative extrema either. Now, the purpose of this section is really not like these last two examples. To find the absolute, you really need to be on a closed interval. So let's look at this next example. Let's put an interval from negative 2 to positive 2. And let's see how that goes. Well, again, we're going to find the critical numbers, so we have to take the derivative. And this time I will be using my quotient rule. So the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. Right, it always will help to simplify in order to find our critical numbers. So when this equals to 0, the numerator would equal to 0. Don't forget your plus or minus when you take that square root. And so I have plus or minus square root of 1. That's when the derivative equals to 0. And then the next thing is we have to look at the denominator to see if it ever would equal to 0. And it wouldn't because if I square something and add 1 and square, it's all positive, never 0. Right now, since we're on a closed interval, what we want to do is we want to evaluate the function, not the derivative, but evaluate the function at all our critical numbers and our endpoints. So I'm going to do these in order. I'm going to do f of negative 2, f of negative 1, f of positive 1, and f of positive 2. So these are our endpoints. These would be our critical numbers. And again, we're going back to the function. And so we're looking for the smallest value and the largest value. Well, I believe that one-half is larger than two-fifths, so this would be the absolute maximum. And then out of these two numbers, which one is the smallest? This would be the smallest, so this would be the absolute minimum. All right, let's practice again on that closed interval. So we take the derivative, set that equal to zero to find our critical numbers and our endpoints. You don't have to do the number line because we are on a closed interval. So we want to evaluate the original function at 0, at 2, and 5. And then see which one is the smallest number. So that's the absolute minimum. And then which one is the largest number. And that's your absolute maximum. All right, so here we have a cubic function, same idea. This time I need to factor. So I'm going to evaluate again my original function at my endpoints and at my critical numbers and just pick out which one's the largest and which one's the smallest. If I have done my arithmetic correct, then I definitely think that 19 would be your absolute maximum because it's the largest value. Now we have a tie. Which one is the lowest? Well, since they're the same number, negative 1 is the absolute minimum value. It just happens to occur in two different places. So if you have a tie, that's all right. Okay, so again, we have the quotient rule just as before. Okay, so our critical numbers is when does this equal to 0, 
it doesn't, but when is it undefined is when x is 1, which is also the same as the denominator. So I need to evaluate my function at the endpoints, which would be 2 and 4, but also the critical number of 1, that's where my function is undefined. Well, let's see, if I plug in 2, I get 3 over 1. I plug in 4, I get 5 over 3, but I can't plug in 1. It's undefined. So that can't give me any information. So the absolute minimum and maximum occurs at these endpoints. So 3 is the biggest, so that would be the maximum. 5 thirds is the smallest, and that would be the minimum. Overall, this is one of the easier assignments uh, in Chapter 4. We're going to now apply that to some word problems. All right, here we are going to be maximizing our profit. We have a profit function, but it is defined in this closed interval between 0 and 200 for x. And it's asking us what amount of advertising will give us the maximum profit. So the amount of advertising would be x, and the maximum profit would be p of x. So I want to take my derivative and set that equal to 0. And then I want to know what the maximum profit would be, and so I want to evaluate my profit function at the endpoints and at my critical numbers. So P of 0 is going to be 230. So I evaluate this at my endpoints of 0 and 200, and then at the critical number 20, and I want to know the maximum, so I'm looking at the largest value, that's 400. So to answer the question, what amount of advertising, that's 20, and that's in hundreds of dollars, so twenty hundred dollars so I would multiply times 100, so I need to add two zeros, so I need to spend $2,000, and the maximum profit would be 430. All right, let's look at this one. This is going to go back to our cost and profit and all of that. So we have a demand equation given here where P denotes the unit price and X denotes the quantity demanded. And of course we have a cost function and it wants to find the level of production that will yield a maximum profit. So they didn't give us a profit. We're going to have to figure out what that is. So we have to go back and remember how do I get Profit. profit is equal to revenue minus the cost. Okay, so I have the cost function, but I don't have the revenue function. Right? The revenue function is price times how many you sell. So we're having P, and we need to multiply that times X. So my revenue function is going to be negative 0.5X plus 600, all of that multiplied by X. So that's negative 0.5x squared plus 600x. That's revenue. We have cost. And so my profit function is going to be revenue minus the whole cost. Okay, lots of icky uh, zeros. But I do want to go ahead and collect like terms and put it in order. So I'm going to do this cubed first. And then I have some x squared, so I have a 0.5x squared, and the, a negative of a negative is going to be positive, so that's going to be negative 0.47x squared. Then we have a 600x minus a 400x, that would be 200x, and then we have this minus 80,000. So that's my profit function. What do we want to do? We want to find the level of production that will yield a maximum profit. So I need to take the derivative and set that equal to zero. Now I'm supposed to be able to solve for x. Well that looks pretty ugly. I don't think I can factor it or anything like that, but I can use the quadratic formula. And yes, you definitely need a calculator for this. All right, so we want the negative b, that's the coefficient of x, plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a, a is all of that, times c, which is 200, all divided by 2 times a, 
and then let's go to the calculator. All right, so the first thing, I'm going to add those and then divide, and I'll get negative 156,879. And the next thing I'm going to do is going to subtract, and I'm going to get positive 212.477. So if I want to know what the maximum profit is, well, let's see. Find the level of production that will yield a maximum profit. The level of production means how many, how many TVs are we going to make. It doesn't ask what the profit is. And so if I want to round to the nearest whole number, the amount of TVs to maximize the profit would be 212. If I wanted to know what that profit would be, I would then have to put that number back into the profit function. So here you want to be really careful about that quadratic formula. The last problem on your homework is going to compare the average cost, and if you remember you divide the cost function by x, that's your average cost, but the marginal cost is the derivative. And it's going to ask you in part c, when are those going to be equal? You're just going to set those functions equal to each other and solve for x, and when you do that, you're going to have to take the cube root of both sides.